my desire for us as a church is, is that this always be a place for us to hear the voice of God. And that is what the church is designed for, is that that's what the music is for. That is what the messages are for. My hope is that as we grow and we keep growing together as a community and as a body, that we get more and more tools to learn how to connect to God through our week and to hear God. Because I, I, believe, I, I believe that when we hear the voice of God, it changes who we are in such wonderful ways. Listening and living with a very loving and creative, fun God. And I believe that is, is what we can do, and that is where we are headed as a church. And that's where I keep leaning through the midst of our family junk. When I was, years ago, hiking the Appalachian Trail, I came across one of the most beautiful women I've ever met in my life. And I wanted to get to know her. We were somewhere in the state of Virginia when I met her, and then we ended up hiking 1,500 miles together. Uh, the trail, the Appalachian Trail, if you've never heard of it, it starts in the state of Georgia, and you hike through 13 states, ending up in the state of Maine, uh, way up in the northeast corner of the United States. And you end on a mountain called Katahdin. Everyone who is able to complete that hike, and uh, most people don't, because there's a lot of physical pain to hike 2,200 miles. There's a lot of emotional wear and tear. You will end up summiting on the very last mountain at the very peak. There's this sign, this little A-frame that says, you have completed. You're done. You have made it. You have succeeded in hiking 2,200 miles. And most people, when you get to this this little, uh, little A-frame with a sign on it, they celebrate. Like you will, as you're hiking up, if you happen to be around anyone, you will start hearing the cheers and the screams and, you know, they're not literally popping champagne, but that's kind of the feeling because when you get to this thing, you have made it five to seven months, all day, every day, of walking and sweating and enduring and you have this kind of this, this financially taxing, emotionally wearing, exhausting, adrenaline rush moment, the sense of accomplishment, I am done, and, and this, this challenge that I had accepted months and months ago, over half a year ago, I have, I have conquered it. And everyone is just kind of high-fiving and they're taking their pictures in groups or a single by themselves. <sighs> yeah. And I remember I got there. This was my moment because I saw it coming. And I was heading up there. And I was getting up near this, this little A-frame little thing and, I, and uh, the sign. And I got there and I, and I touched it. And I had no sense of joy. I had no sense of excitement, no sense of adrenaline. I had no sense of accomplishment. Because here's what I was thinking in my mind. There is a blizzard coming in. And if I have to get pulled off, uh, this is not going to be a good thing. And even climbing up the mountain, Emma, uh, her name was Lama. I didn't really know her real name. I had known her as the name Lama because everyone has these different trail names. Anyhow, so Lama and I, we had started that morning together, but she couldn't do it because she was sick, and there were the, these giant boulders you had to climb, and they were covered in ice, and she was sliding off of them, and she's like, whoa, this is not safe. I'm not at my best strength. So she didn't actually complete on that day, but there was this uh, storm coming in that was going to sock the mountain in for the next five days with blizzard conditions, and it was already coming in. It was snowing. I'm up there. It's snowing. The wind is whipping around, and I'm like, I need to get off this mountain still alive and safe. And so I started the long trek of going back down, because going down is worse than going up. And it was just, it was just the sun, you couldn't see the sun, it was already about four at night and it was just coming. I'm like, I've got a couple hours to get down this mountain, it's dark, and then when I got to the bottom of the mountain, I thought, I'm actually, 
that's great that I'm off the mountain, but the town where my stuff is, where, where Emma is, Lama, and, and all of my safety is still 15 miles away, and it's now nine at night, and I don't know how to get there. So, and there's not a lot of traffic for me to hitchhike, and I've got to figure out how do I get from here to there, and I'm still in these blizzard uh, conditions, and I just remember the kind of the fear and, and, and some of the stress going, I'm still not done. I still have to keep going. In the Christian experience, I think most people, what we would really love is as we're experiencing our faith, is somehow that we would have this, this moment where you're like, I did it. I've accomplished the Christian spirituality. I have this Christian faith. I've, I've got the life. The life of that, that, that Christianity has somehow promised me, that I feel like God has promised me. But the Christian experience is very counterintuitive. It is not something that you conquer. When I first started following Jesus, I was full of a lot of idealism and a lot of excitement. I had a lot of ambition, which I know, I know, God gives God gives us ambition. He gives us dreams. He gives us vision. He gives us this passion. That is one of the beautiful things about youth. Never throw a rock at the idealism of youth. That is a gift that God gives the youth. They, the, the youth, they shake us up and they make us uncomfortable because of their idealism. Don't throw rocks at that. But I wanted to conquer the Christian faith when I was a teenager. And I hope some of, the, some of this will connect with some of your journeys in your Christian faith. One of my favorite authors that I love to read, and I handed a book out by Richard Rohr about a month ago, but he wrote another book that was absolutely probably one of my top 10 favorite books that I've read, and it's called Everything Belongs. One of my absolute favorite books. It is such a counterintuitive book, which is why I love it. It's... It, He's this Catholic man, uh, Richard Rohr, who leads this retreat center. And so much of the Catholic traditions have been coming back into kind of mainstream Protestant uh, churches. And I love it where it's reaching back into some of the traditions of even before the Reformation, where we're digging back into the history of our spirituality as a Christian people. And this is what he says. He says, the only true perfection available to us is the honest acceptance of our imperfection. The only true perfection available to us is the honest acceptance of our imperfection. Some of us need to come to grips with this foundation of our journey. So often our experience of Christianity is to conquer our weaknesses. To conquer the areas in our life where there is sin or, or, or broken things or, or where there's damage or just junk, to conquer it. And I grew up in my Christian life. I, I had so much shame and I had such high idealism at the same time of what it was to live this Christian life, but I had this kind of low level encounter with God and I had almost very little to no transformation that was happening compared to this high idealism of what I thought it was to follow Jesus and what it was to be a Christian, but how I was living my life and what was going on inside of me felt so low and because of that I was slipping into shame every day always feeling like, God, I'm failing you. I can't live this Christian life. And I, I felt like I was also failing myself. I can't do what it is that you want me to do, God. And so I was trying to live this Christian life with all of my energy, but for some reason I had this sense of inadequacy and a sense of shame and disappointment every day. I can't do this. I'm just a fraud. I'm a failure. And I grew up in the evangelical church like so many of us here did. And, and, and we would sing this song as a kid. It was, it was a great song, and it planted this theological seed in, in my heart. It says, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love, so be careful, little eyes, what you see. Anyone know that song? Yeah. That is such a damaging song. And I never caught on to this as a, as a kid. There's a father above looking down in love. 
And I never caught that part of it because the song seemed to be more emphasizing what it is that you're looking at. What are you looking at? What are you doing? What is it that you see? Because you're going to disappoint him. You're going to disappoint God, and he's going to get angry. So you better get your act together. You need to be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. And the Christian life felt like it was more about I have to guard myself, and I needed to master these things as a kid, and then I needed to master them as a teenager, and then I needed to master them as an adult. It was kind of like the Avis motto for my life, but it was in Christian terms. We try harder. And that is what I needed to do. And, and so I put the we try harder button. I would put it on my coat of my Christian experience. You know, let's go for God. Let's go for Jesus and let's keep trying harder. Let's conquer our faith. Let's conquer the Christian journey. Everyone else is doing it wrong. They're not doing it right in church, but I know maybe better what we can be doing because I somehow am more passionate. I have more faith. I have more life and I, I know that I can do it because everyone else is somehow failing me. And I would just throw rocks at every Christian I saw because somehow I thought, I'm going to try harder and I'm going to finally accomplish what it is that I don't see anyone else around me accomplishing. So I tried harder. And, 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 and there was absolutely no joy. I had no love for God. I had no joy in life. I left very confused and, and if you are there, if that would resonate with any of you, if that is something that you're like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, conquering ambition, excitement, and, and forceful about being the person of God, who God wants you to be, that is all really good, to want to be who it is that God wants us to be, the best version of ourselves. And never, never, never lose the idealism for what, what, what God even wants to do in your life. That is not what I am advocating. Do not lose that passion and that, that hope. But also know this, the whole Christian experience it is so counterintuitive. Just when you think it should work the way that you think it should work and how you want this Christian life to work, God oftentimes he will speak into it and say, I want to come at this whole Christian experience from a different direction. And it can just spin you around. Today we're going to dive into Luke chapter 18, verse 9 says this, then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. The two went to the temple, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. And in the footnote, uh, it says that he prayed to himself. And I go, well, that's kind of weird. Uh, it says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like the tax collector. Oh, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance, and he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven. And as he prayed, instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And I tell you this, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. The messed up, miserable tax collector who had ideals said, I can't seem to get out of my own way of what it is that who God wants me to be. And I wish I could be the man that God wants. And Jesus said, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And that man went home in a right relationship with God. There are two kinds of spirituality that we're just going to talk about this morning. You have pharisaical spirituality and tax collector 
spirituality. And I, I, I want to start with a pharisaical spirituality first because there are two components to this. It says, first is that they have something to prove. The goal here is the, for the Pharisee is a mastery of their faith, a mastery of the Christian disciplines. And there are so many good things that you need to know are, are so good about the, the disciplines of the Christian faith. Richard Foster, such a gifted author, he wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline. I've shared that many times. It's a classic book for my generation. Uh, this fabulous recovery that he wrote of the, the, how the church needs to recover these disciplines of the Christian faith, that if we lean into them, they will help us get right with and be in a, a good position to be able to connect and to hear God. And so many of those traditions over time, they keep getting lost. And so he's this advocate saying, we need these Christian disciplines. But Richard Foster says this himself. He says, you don't conquer these disciplines. And, and some of these would be things like fasting, and, and prayer, and solitude, and, and giving, simplicity, all of them that he introduces at the beginning of his book. He says the goal is not that we have mastery of the spiritual disciplines in any terms, but that we would keep leaning into them as tools so that we can feel and connect to the heartbeat of God. But, but somehow, I grew up being taught that you had to master these disciplines of the Christian faith. If you're going to be right with God, you have to master them and do them right. You've got to be some kind of spiritual uh, achiever. And we have to lead the way. And, and, and to please God, you need to be able to achieve. You have to do more. You've got to do better. And you need to be able to prove yourself that you are doing it right to not just yourself, but to God. And, and you do need to prove yourself to yourself. And I want to feel better about my Christian experience as if, if I feel better about how I'm doing, maybe then God feels better about me. So now I feel like my relationship is going to be based on how I feel like I'm doing. I don't know how many of you wake up in the morning and you get up and you, you go get your coffee or something else and then you kind of have this devotional time with God. Maybe you read the Bible, maybe you have a devotional of some kind because I think a lot of us might say, well, you know, I try to do that. I try, to, or at some point during my day, I try to read, the, you know, scripture or try to read some kind of book that will help me get my thoughts on God. How many of you would say, and this is rhetorical, don't actually answer me, but answer to yourself, which is, how many of you would say that you think God likes you more on the day that you do a devotional or spend time with him than on the day you don't? Oh. And how many of you feel like God loves you more on the week that you're really actively living out your Christian faith and, 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 and you're, you're leaning into what God is wanting you to do as opposed to the week where maybe whew, you've really blown it more. God loves me more on the weeks that I'm really leaning into him. What's going on when we do something right in the Christian life and we feel like we get more of God's approval and more of God's favor, just a little bit more on our journey and our walk with him. Because something is very seriously wrong here if that is what is happening. Where the whole thing is somehow, I've got to prove something. Where many of us are trying to kind of accomplish something because we're spiritual achievers. And I, I got to tell you, sometimes... I lead the way on this, and I have most of my life, and I still try to lead the way. And God just keeps pounding into my brain. It's the spirituality of imperfection. I want to prove something to myself. We want to prove things to ourselves. And God says, the Pharisee, that is what they are trying to do, is they're trying to prove something to themselves. The tax collector knows he has nothing to prove to God, and he is the one who goes home justified. Something to prove, something to prove. Uh, and second of all, something to compare. The Pharisee looks around at all the other people that are around him, and he's like, I'm, I'm not like them. I'm not like him or her. And some of us, we might be sitting here today and we're pursuing our Christian life with all kinds of intensity. And, and, and we're looking at other people and say, ah, you know, that person over there, I don't think they are. And, and I'm so glad I'm not like them. 
God must feel better about me because, well, I, keep, I'm, I go to church more than them or I do this more than them. Thank God I'm not like that other person who's drifting away with some kind of lazy spirituality, faith taking everything for granted. Because I'm intense about my Christian journey. I've got something going on and I'm alive and people know it. I mean, people know, people know. People know. They look at me and, and I set the bar. I'm the standard. And people ask me because you know they want me on leadership because they know that I've got my Christian life together. And I feel good about that. Too bad other people don't have their lives figured out. I'm a little bit further along than they are. But when we start to compare, when we assume that God feels better or good about us, because we're doing the right things and we're doing what the Pharisee is doing then. One of, one of the things he brought up to the table was an offer of, of comparison. He says, I fast, I tithe, I pray. That's what, that's what the Pharisee said. This is what I'm bringing. I'm bringing this. And, and I go, could there be three other, I mean, those, those might be the three most significant disciplines that we could say we should be bringing to the table, that we should be bringing to our journey with God, where I am fasting and I am praying and I'm tithing. Those are foundational. Because I, I, I know if I can just conquer those, I will be at the top of the list. And so then I start to look for other people who have never fasted. Well, they don't seem to tithe. And I don't ever know that they, they, they pray. I've never seen them do that. And what would happen if, if I was to ask us to raise our hand and, and say, you know what, what, I've got a really good prayer life. I would, I, I would, oh. And I hope none of us would be able to say that, honestly. I hope none of us would raise our hand. Oh, I've got a really good prayer life. I'm, I'm a good evangelist. Man, I'm amazing at tithing. Uh, you know, I serve God. I do these things. I try harder. I work at this. And, and, and it's what I'm known for. Everyone knows that's what I'm good at in the Christian faith. And, and when we, we can't, I kinda, uh, I've kind of led other people to believe that maybe I am good at those things, even if I'm not really good at them. But I need people to at least think that I'm good at them. And so then I'm going to start faking people out as I grow in this Christian life and in the Christian walk. And, and now I'm letting others think that I'm some kind of spiritual person who's very attuned to what it is that God's doing in the world around us and in my own heart. And maybe I am, I let people believe I'm going to be the best example for others to look at because I really want people to admire me. But secretly, we know that we don't have it together and I'm not as good as I have led other people to believe. When I was a small kid, my mom took me to swim lessons uh, as I grew up in Hillsboro, Oregon, and my dro mom dropped me off at the beginner class. And uh, so at the beginner class on your first day, what you do is you, you get in the water and they give you one of those little uh, foam boards and, and they put you in the shallow end and you, you paddle and you kick and you start to try and learn how to do the dog paddle. Um, and that's kind of where you, everyone starts. No problem if you're in the shallow end and you can actually just stand up. Uh, and pretend you're dog paddling or if you have a, the board and you never let go of it. So the next day the instructor uh, says, okay, so now that you all know how to dog paddle, we're going to go down to the deep end and, and I'm going to go out into the middle of the pool and what I want you to do is one at a time jump in, dog paddle out to me and then back to the thing. And you know, the next person dives, goes in and jumps in and the dog paddle back in, back out and the line keeps moving forward and then it's my turn to come up and I, I didn't know how to dog paddle. But I didn't know how to say I didn't know how to dog paddle. I didn't say that I kept faking it the day before. And I kept standing when I should have been learning and because I was scared to death. But I was even more scared to let people know I didn't know how to dog paddle because everyone else in front of me knew how to dog paddle. So, of course, I'm sure I know how to dog paddle because they all seem to have figured it out. All I need to do is jump in the water. So I jump in the water and immediately I start to panic. And the girl who's coming back towards me with her dog paddle, I grab her and we both go under. I don't have any memory beyond that. You know, I mean, I was five years old at the time. Maybe I was four. I don't remember. I don't have any memory other than I'm alive. So somehow they pulled me out, got me out, and I'm okay, and I'm hoping that girl is still okay. <laughs> <sighs> I, 
I got caught doing something that I was trying to pretend at. In the Christian experience, I want you to know something. There are so many people in ministry, pastors, who are faking it. And we come across like Christian leaders where we have it all together. We don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. We disappoint ourselves, and we try the best as we can not to disappoint other people. We are working at that. Well, I can't speak for them. Maybe you're familiar with the mythological character Sisyphus. Sisyphus was uh, a man who was condemned to roll this large stone up a hill only to have it roll down again over and over and over again for all eternity. So, and as I've been working through my own spiritual journal, I wrote, uh, journey, I wrote this in my journal, which is I feel like oftentimes in my own spiritual life, I am pushing a stone up the hill and I feel like I'm up against these unbelievable odds. The Christian journey is such a struggle. I don't feel like I can win at this. Is this assumption grounded in my belief that my spirituality depends on myself instead of God? And this focus keeps leading me to the feeling of unworthiness, and I hate that feeling of feeling unworthy. So I try harder, and then I find that the stone has rolled down the hill again, so I try to push it back up, thinking that maybe this time I'll get to the top. Sisyphus never did get to the top. And, and that's what he was condemned to do for all of eternity. And if I ever did get to the top, if I ever get to the top of the spiritual journey of my life, I would be the most dangerous place of all. Because then I will have taken God's place and put myself there. And then I wrote this. <laughs> Damn my spiritual achievements fall to the bottom of the hill and just let the stone roll over you. Fall to the bottom of the hill and come to the realization that I can't conquer the Christian life the way that I think I'm supposed to. I'm ready for something more positive now this morning. We got that out of the way. I want to look at the positive of the the, the, the tax collector spirituality. The tax collector spirituality, look at verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Oh, that is such a beautiful picture to me. The tax collector turns everything upside down here. Jesus, who is telling the story, turns everything upside down. Instead of trying harder, he collapses into his brokenness. There's nothing here about his achievements. There's nothing here about the mastering or conquering of the Christian life. Nothing here about anything to make God more pleased with him so that he can be happy with himself. But the surprise about the story is the contradiction about what is being taught about religion and, and walking with God and, and, and for faith, people of faith who are going in the direction of Jesus who have decided to go in a different direction than maybe they had thought they were supposed to be going or had been taught that they had to be going. It's this counterintuitive spirituality. In, in his book, The Fifth Discipline, the author writes about a story that he was rafting in the state of Maine uh, this one year. And when you've been rafting, have many of you ever done whitewater rafting? Fantastic. Then you know, I mean, you know the different classes where you've got, you know, the class one and two and three and four and five. And as it goes up, they get progressively harder, more, more rocks, more whitewater, more danger, the rapids, you know, the classes as they go up. And when you get to class five, has anyone done a class five? Oh my goodness. We actually have people who've done it. Whew. That's impressive. A lot of times when you get to class five, the rapids and, and the water is so dangerous that it is unsafe and you're really taking your life into your hands. And it's a wet your pants moment. But thankfully, you're already in the water. No one's going to know. It's totally cool. Everyone's done it. 
But they can be so dangerous that oftentimes what people will do when you get to that class is you get out of the water, you take the raft with you, and you carry it as a group of people, and you portage it around that dangerous section, and then you put the raft back in the water, you get back in, and you keep going. doesn't mean you're, you're scared of all rapids. You just have a healthy fear of your own mortality, and you realize your skill level does not yet equate to the level of, of the rapids that are, you had the, before you. But what happens when you come to a waterfall? Oftentimes, that is a great place to portage because that can go beyond level five if you're smart. And so in the story that he was telling, he says you know, that, that they were watching this guy uh, as they were going, portaging, uh, carrying the, the raft down. And on this one day, the author says, we got out and watched this drunk guy celebrating life coming down in his raft, and he decides that he can safely shoot the waterfall. He goes over and down the other side and gets caught in the back, the backwash at the bottom. And he's caught in it, and he's fighting the water, and he couldn't get out of this turning water. And he was getting colder, and he was getting into hypothermia, and finally he couldn't get out, and he gives up. And he goes under the water, sucked down. He had nothing left to give and he disappears. About 10 or 15 yards down, he pops up out of the water. The very thing that he had been fighting was the very thing that worked to get him free. And that is how it goes in the Christian life. The very thing that you think you have to do is the very thing that might take you out in the end. And that is... I need to fight against the powers of darkness and forces and the things that are going on inside of me. I have to fight them if I'm going to win this Christian journey. The one thing about the tax collector that I find so interesting is he didn't want to be a sinner. He didn't want that. He was broken. He didn't, he didn't want to keep living the way that he was living. He didn't want to keep living with the things that were going on inside him. He was tired of that. He had had enough parties. He had had enough high times. He had had enough money, ripping people off, doing the right thing. He was done with that life, and he was trying to find a way out of that life. And Jesus was kind enough to tell him how not to do it. And it's awesome when God kind of comes in it's awesome of God to not let us even have our own way sometimes. So the tax collector spirituality, I read this quote that said, constantly suspect your own righteousness. Constantly suspect your own righteousness. I'm sure you've seen this picture of the iceberg before. It, it, you know, it's been flying around the internet for over 20 years. Since the internet started, this picture has been on it. And it's such a great uh, photo where you've got these, just the beautiful blues, and there's other uh, classic ones that people have been putting up for years. Uh, you know, I've all often wondered if it's even real, but, but I think it's been floating around before Photoshop was even invented, so I'm, I still kind of hope that it's real and true uh, photo. But you can see this top part of uh, the iceberg, but how massive it is underneath. And it's such one of the coolest things. But as we move in a Christian life, for how many years that we have left in us, you need to know something about yourself. As much as you move forward in your Christian life, the bottom of that iceberg is going to be about the same at the end of your life as it is at the beginning of your life. As we grow and God is moving in our hearts and lives and we're getting God's transforming us to be the best version of ourselves and healing us and moving in us, through your life, if we can raise that iceberg up a foot or two, maybe even a yard if you're a super achiever, as you learn to walk with God and lean into the things that Jesus is doing, and as we start to deal with some of the dark stuff in our hearts or, or those closets that we don't want to reveal to anyone else, kind of our false self, the more you move down in your Christian journey in life, trust this. There is a lot underneath us, and it will always be there. 
And you might be tempted to say, okay, so how do, you know, how do, we, how do we get it out? How do I deal with all of this stuff that is going on inside of me? Because we do, every one of us. We've got a lot of stuff inside of us. But the reason that Jesus died to save us was not so that we could get that iceberg out of the water and to deal with all of the sin and junk in our lives. It's because we can never get the iceberg out. Does that make sense? The bottom is this kind of hidden self, the false self, all the junk that's in us. And the stuff we don't even know about yet, which we all have, it will always be there. And if God were to reveal that to us, it would be so overwhelming. Isaiah screams out as God's holiness is revealed to him. He just has this, in in the Bible, it talks about Isaiah, he kind of has this view of God, and he just says in Isaiah 6, he says, woe is me, I feel like I'm at the bottom of the iceberg, it is unbelievable, I can't wipe out this vision, it's overwhelming, and I, I don't, I don't know why God hasn't taken me out when I see the depth of the stuff that's inside of me. Why hasn't you taken me out, God? I am of nothing here. And Paul had this understanding as he's writing these letters in the New Testament to their, like he's got this one where he's writing the Corinthians and it says this, and it's in the spring of of 56. He says, I am the least of the apostles. In the fall of 60, he writes, I am the least of all of God's People. And then in the fall of 62, he writes, I am actually the worst of sinners. He's going into this beautiful descent. Year after year, he's understanding more and more. From apostle to God's people to everyone out there, I'm getting so in touch with myself and my spirituality and my journey with God. How can I ever elevate myself above anyone? Because I have come to realize the more I do this spiritual journey, I am the worst of all sinners. I know the darkness that's inside of me. I know how dark my heart really is. I'm so in touch with God that I keep seeing that more and more. Philippians 3. In this famous text about his righteousness is not being his own, he says, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable to to prove my value to God, to prove myself to God and others. So like I used to do when I was a Pharisee. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything, counting it as garbage, as crap, so that I can gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness, though through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith alone. And we preach this stuff in the evangelical church. And then we challenge people, go out and now prove yourself to God and and be obedient and go win God's favor and go do the right thing now. We have to keep pulling ourselves back to these encounters, these moments of truth, and they're all the way through the Bible that are just crammed, especially in the New Testament. Devotion is so much more important than discipline. Awareness of who you are and your relationship with God and the studying of truth that you are in a relationship with the creator of the universe, and that is before discipline in your journey with God. And if we put discipline above devotion, if we put discipline before a higher view of God and the reality of who we are, of ourselves, then we're on the wrong side of the line and and I'm going to live my life differently. And ultimately, it's going to burn me out. I'm going to burn out of the Christian faith and think it's a just a, a throw it out the window. It's a, just a bunch of junk. True spirituality has nothing to do with our accomplishments. We develop this kind of spirituality which starts to, again, orbit around ourselves. Has anyone ever come up to you and asked, how are you doing spiritually? 
Mm. How are you doing spiritually? Have you ever heard that? Has anyone ever done that to you? Oh, I praise you. If you're shaking your head and I'm seeing people go, no, I'm like, thank you. I don't know if you've ever asked that question because sadly I have. How do you feel, for those of you that have had it asked, how do you feel when someone asks you that question? How are you doing spiritually? I don't know if you feel it right inside of you right now. Because what's your first response? Because what my brain starts to do starts spinning over the last day or the last week or the last month of your Christian journey. And you're like, okay, what's going on? Uh, what is good? What is good that I can tell them so that they don't see me as a failure, so that they see that I'm actually moving forward and maybe I can even impress them and tell them all the good things that are going on because if I tell them that I'm really wrestling and struggling, ah, especially as a pastor, if I say if I'm having a really crappy day or this week is just really bad, will they fire me? Will they say, well, maybe you shouldn't be preaching. Maybe you need to be stopping. Maybe you're not, you, know, you, you shouldn't be in ministry. When the reality is, oh, okay, not, let's back to this. I don't know what's going on when we start asking that question because I start looking for the, instead of sharing where I really am, I want to I wanna share something that I feel like I'm supposed to say. And I go, well, what's going on? How are you doing spiritually? Because here's the question. Here would be a better question. How is God doing spiritually? Because God is doing really good on my behalf and God is doing really good on your behalf. And I like that. How are you doing spiritually? See, that's God's deal as he moves along with you and me. But for me to say, you know, I'm doing good spiritually or I feel really good about my spiritual life, might mean that you're starting to follow the wrong path again. See, Paul never goes there in his writings. He never says that. Where do you ever hear Paul say, I feel really good about how I'm doing spiritually? You know, I'm, I've got some really th- good things down. I feel like I've got a solid foundation. I'm really going, and I want to tell you about it. You know what? I led someone to Christ this last week, and I'm feeling great about that. My devotions, man, they're, I'm crushing it. I've, I've, got, I've been on a 108-day streak, and I've, every day I've had at least 30 minutes, if not up to two hours. My tithing, all-time high. Not only do I give 10%, I've gone upward of 20, and I just need you to know I'm doing so good at that. The more God gives me, I'm just really pouring it all back in. My prayer life it rocks. I feel so good about this. We never hear any of that from Paul. Okay, so Kenny, are you telling me that we don't need to be involved in these things? Of course we need to be involved in doing them. But it's not because we're trying to win God's approval or God's favor or get God or someone else to be impressed with us. For me, it's not about me feeling better about myself. It's about me leaning into this journey and a walk and having a relationship with God and to love Him more and more and to depend on His righteousness and letting Him draw close to me. It's me not measuring myself but measuring the one who is adequate for me, the one who is coming to me, who, is, who just loves me and his righteousness. It is so counterintuitive. The Pharisee prays to himself. The tax collector prays. His, his prayers are full of humility. Because his prayers start to orbit around God. The tax collector, he's on his knees and and and, because our spirituality revolves around God. If we could talk to Mother Teresa, if she were alive, if we could talk to Billy Graham or or many of the great saints who had moved kind of further along in their spiritual journey. What you need to know about them is that the further they go, the greater their awareness was for dependence on God and this deep need for more of God. See, their idealism uh, about wanting to be like Christ, it never faded. Their reality of the fact that 
They had a dependence on God. And that, that just grew in them throughout their life to higher and higher levels of their desperate need for God. They needed God more at the end of their lives than they did at the beginning. So you've got this man who, who dies and he goes to heaven. Of course, St. Peter's the one who's going to meet him at the pearly gates. And, and St. Peter says, so here's how it works. You need 100 points uh, to make it into heaven. So you tell me all the good things you've done in your life, and I'm going to give you a certain uh, point value for each of the good things that you've, you've done in your life, depending on how good it was. And when you reach 100 points, I open the doors and you get to come in to heaven. And the guy's like, oh, all right. I, all right, I can, okay. Well, I was married to the same woman for 50 years. I never cheated on her, not even in my heart. Oh, well, that's wonderful, says St. Peter. That's worth three points. Oh, okay, uh, three points. Well, I, I attended church all of my life. I supported ministry with all of my tithes and my service. Wow, terrific, says Peter. That's fantastic. Good job. That's, that's worth another point. Whew, uh, one point. Well, uh, I started a soup kitchen in my city, and I worked in a shelter for homeless people for, for years and, and for, for veterans. Oh, fantastic. That's another two points, he says. Two points, the man says. Uh, well, at this rate, the only way I'm ever going to get into heaven is by God's grace itself. Ah! St. Peter smiles. There's your 100 points. It's the only way. That is where it goes. And that is what we need to be at the end in total dependence on God for our righteousness. I want to go to the first beatitude to kind of wrap this up. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who know they don't have it together. They will never have it together, but they have this deep hunger for God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. For we don't give up. We don't give up the hunger and thirst because we're poor in spirit. The first beatitude, that is a starting place, but that's not where we move from. We don't then go somewhere else. It's a place we always stay. The day that you came to Jesus and you realize they desperately need you, we don't leave that spot ever. If you want to know a kingdom truth, it's that you and I are poor in spirit. We are. We just have to keep recognizing that every single day. And then we learn to live in the realization of what is really happening. And the more we are content with the poverty that we don't want to be in, the closer we are to God. Poverty is the door to freedom, finding nothing that's good in ourselves that's worth defending, and we cling to God, who is our only hope, and that's where I rest, and I start to find my confidence and my strength, but that doesn't mean I ever walk in this confidence and strength. I'm always in this position of dependence and total need and desperation for God. Jesus says to us, he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, let go of this spirituality that revolves around you. Be done with that for the rest of your life. What I've learned through my journey as in this Christian life so far is it's come a little closer to this. Everything I've done, all of my righteousness is just filthy rags. Nothing I've done in my life is worth bragging over. None of the great things I've ever done. And some of us, we're scorekeepers. And, and, and the worst scorekeepers are the long-term churchgoers. Uh, you know, where they grew up being taught how to, you know, we got to please God, and most of them, they're, they're very good at it. The church is a great ple place for people to come together and model that to other people kind of the latest spiritual fashion show, uh, you know, what, what, what it is we're wearing. And a lot of people, they come with are striving. And, and it makes, we're making these masks. 
And we like faking people out because we don't want people to know what's really going on inside of us. And the reason so many people have, they walked away from the church and they've walked away from the life of Christ that comes through the church is they simply say, this whole thing is a joke. As I look around, these people don't live up to what it is they say they believe. The divorce rate is just as high in the church as it is outside of it. Abuse to their children is just as high. These Christians, they're just as materialistic. They just are whatever it is as the same as everyone else. And then they say the church has the audacity to tell them how it is that we need to function in regards to moralities or what it is we're supposed to teach in our schools or how we're supposed to vote. Where do they get off telling us that? How pharisaical is that? And it drives me nuts, and it's killing the church, and we scream at the world that they're doing it wrong, and then we like to go out of the church in our own secret, hidden little ways, practice so many of the self-smug little telling ourselves we're doing it better because we have Jesus, when in reality, we're not. But, but we tell ourselves, well, we're not as bad as them. They're so much worse. We're so much better. The only thing that is available to me and to you is the honest acceptance of our imperfections. That's it. That's it. That's all we got. I am one of the worst golfers you will ever meet in this world. But I do enjoy golf. Uh, If I was to get under 150, that's a good day for me. I think the best I've ever shot actually is like a, a... I think the best I've ever done on a nine, no, it was an 18 hole. I, I hit around 120. And, and that's horrible if you don't know. That's just awful. I do enjoy the game. I like to go hit the balls. Uh, my favorite way to play golf, though, is best ball. Anyone ever played best ball? It's a fantastic way to play. It is the best way. It's where you go out and you, you all take your turn. Everyone gets up. You, you, know, you take your swing and, and, and you follow it. Hopefully not lose it in the trees. Uh, but everyone takes their turn hitting the ball. Whoever had the best hit, we all move to that location. We all lay our balls down and we all hit again. And wherever, whoever had the best hit, we all grab our balls and we move to where the best hit location is. And so when you play best ball, oftentimes as a group, you can get, uh, it's easy to get par. Sometimes you can, you know, you can get an eagle, you can do uh, far better and, and you can move forward. And you're like, man, we're, we're doing great. And it's one of the best ways to ever play. One day I go to a golf course and I'm imagining, uh, I imagine Jesus is there. And he's standing on the first green, and he's waiting for me. And so I, you know, my first tee off, I get up there, and he says, hey, do you want to play best ball with me? And I say, I would love to play best ball with you. My first hit, pitch, <laughs> right into the water. Uh, he's like, don't worry about it. And, and don't, don't get it. Just, just grab another ball and put it where, I'm gonna, you know, where I hit mine. The next one I hit goes off into the woods. But then my next one, the third one, for me, I had a really good shot. Um, but, but whatever happens, as we're moving down the course, uh, we're kind of moving along together, and we're playing par, even under par, and, and, and we even got an eagle here and there together. And I finally run out of balls because I'd, I'd lost so many. And he tells me, don't worry about that. I've got a, I've got a whole bag full of balls. Just keep playing with me. And I'm thinking as I'm playing, I'm like, this is so much fun. I love this. And, and we get back to the clubhouse, and, and Jesus asks me, hey, do you want to come do this again with me tomorrow? Let's play best ball again. That was so much fun. And, and I think for less than a fraction of a second, do you, do you really want to uh, play with me? Because my game is so bad. I'm horrible at this. And he tells me, I love playing with you because you depend on me. I ask him, I says, "Uh," I say, don't you want to play with some of those other guys? You know, there's these guys that were sitting around this table and they're having this great time, uh, you know, taking, they're eating snacks and just drinking and they're laughing about as they're reminiscing about the game they had just played. 
telling each other about their best shots and laughing, having the best time. I'm like, well, don't you want to play with them? And this is what he tells me, he says. They don't want to play best ball with me. They're too, they're too good to want to play with me because they think they have it all together. But if you show up tomorrow, I'll play best ball golf with you. And as you depend on me, you're going to get better at your game. You just will. But you'll always be connected to my game. Because when you play with me, you'll always play best ball golf. Because that is the Christian life. That is the Christian experience. That is the starting point for everything. I'm not the only one who's had a really hard week. I know that for a fact. I had someone tell me the other day, yeah, but my week isn't as bad as yours, Kenny. I'm like, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We're not comparing. Bad is bad. We all have our own stuff. I just want to pray for you guys today. And then we got... Just two more songs that kind of... And the reason why oftentimes we put music at the end is because maybe, maybe I'm not ready to talk to you guys. Maybe you're not ready to talk to me. It's kind of like this little buffer. But it's also a time where maybe God's wanting to talk to you and you need time to process before you talk to anyone else. So we're gonna, I'm going to pray and then... We're going to go into two, two more videos and then we'll wrap it up. And if you need to leave, I know we're going long today. I didn't expect that. I'm so sorry. Feel free to leave if you need to. But I'm going to pray for us. Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear your heart and your love for us. Help us to be able to live with a different kind of faith and spirituality that is dependent on you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That we would stay there and not be scared of staying there. So for those who are in pain, I know there's a lot of us. Different issues, different heartaches. We ask that you be very present and real. Bring your love, bring your presence and your peace. God, I don't know what outcomes are going to happen for anyone's life, let alone mine. But regardless of where our life goes and what the outcomes are of our pain and our situations, you are still God, and you are still so worthy of all of our praise and all of our love and all of our worship. Help us to enter into worshiping you today and as we move into our week.